the Mil Milliken Legacy Forum on Education Policy and Finance. Uh, we're glad you could join us. We're going to wait a couple minutes uh, to make sure everyone else can join. Started. Uh, I am Matt Grossman. I'm director of MSU's Institute for Public Policy and Social Research. Uh, and my co-host is uh, Brian Beverly, who's director of MSU's Office of K-12 Outreach uh, and is co-sponsoring today's event, uh, which was suggested by Rusty Hills and follows Governor Milliken's memorial service in August. Milliken was Michigan's longest serving governor who casts an enormous shadow over the state and had a major effect on education. Many of the same concerns uh, that he faced echo today. And so we wanted to bring back those with direct, direct experience under the Milliken administration and put them into conversation with uh, current issues. Some of our speakers served in the administration, others service spans from then to now, uh, and others seek to build upon and beyond uh, what has uh, come before. Uh, we know that uh, voices of passion, moderation, courtesy, and gracious listening uh, before bold action are needed now more than ever. And we thank those who were inspired by Governor Milliken's respect and regard for the citizens that he served. I also wanna thank Cindy Kyle and Arnold Weinfeld for putting together today's event and Bill Milliken Jr. for assistance and for the beautiful portrait that we were able to use for uh, promotion. Brian, you wanna add any words of welcome? I'd like to say uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, looking forward to today's conversation. Uh, pleased and honored to uh, co-sponsor this event with the Institute for Public Policy and Social Research. Looking forward to uh, future collaborations between uh, that office and the Office of K-12 Outreach. And we are as well, thank you. Uh, so there is a chat box for anyone who wants to ask uh, questions, can ask them uh, right there and uh, give, send them to all panelists and we will uh, make sure we, we get to them. Uh, today's first panel is uh, going to be covering education, finance and equity. And then the second will cover infrastructure and uh, learning. Uh, and both panels will be structured uh, having uh, experience a, a panelist with direct, direct experience in the Millican administration, uh, one on current issues, and then one that's able to, to bridge the gap. Uh, we've asked speakers to limit their remarks uh, to leave time for Q&A and discussion. Uh, so uh, feel free to have those uh, questions uh, started in uh, the chat box. And there's full biographies uh, available on our website and we'll also post uh, this uh, form uh, for you to go back to uh, at a later time. So thanks for joining us. Uh, unfortunately, we have to start on a, a little bit of a sad note, which is that our first speaker, Jim Phelps, um, is not uh, feeling well. And so he's asked me to deliver uh, his uh, remarks. Uh, he is, I believe, going to uh, still be available um, uh, for the Q&A uh, uh, discussion, um, but he's gonna be a little bit in and out. Uh, so I apologize uh, for that. But Jim was education advisor for uh, Governor Milliken and served uh, in the Department of Education. Uh, and then we're, that's gonna be followed by uh, Bill Rustum, who is chief staff advisor to Milliken on environmental matters and is the retired president and CEO of public sector consultants uh, to bridge the gap. And then we'll have on the first panel, David Arson, uh, professor of education policy and K through 12 educational administration at MSU to discuss the current issues in education funding and equity. Uh, so here are uh, Phelps remarks, which were uh, co-developed uh, with uh, Doug Roberts. He's titled it, To the Governor. Thank you for this opportunity to share our personal and professional recollections of our time in the Millican administration. There was a memorial for the governor in August and Doug Roberts and I wrote a piece for the occasion. Here is a portion. In 1969, I, this is Phelps talking, started with the governor and Doug was staffed to the House Taxation Committee. Over two decades, Doug and I were participants in the major events in education and taxation. We worked with, not for the governor. While he was our boss, he never treated us that way. He treated us with great respect as if we were colleagues, not subordinates. He had strong convictions regarding education and dedicated himself to making a difference. Here are some of our personal insights of what happened. This is a recounting of his strength of character and how he fulfilled his commitment. The Commission. 
There was a study on Michigan education funding that highlighted the disparities in per pupil spending. Governor Milliken decided to plunge into the issue by establishing a commission on education reform. I met with the governor to interview for a staff position. As I entered his office, the governor stood and extended his hand. He asked me about my background, then a series of questions about my relationship with education groups. He wanted to know if I would be an independent thinker or just a representative of the school lobby. He was looking for someone who would tell it like it is, be loyal and discreet. He was looking for someone to collect the necessary information and provide it directly to him in language he could understand, preferably in one page. He wanted to be fully prepared to make tough decisions. When in his office, his car going to a meeting or a phone call or at lunch at the stateroom, he always finished with the hot fudge Sunday. He was always gracious and thirsty for knowledge. I would write speeches for him and he seemed to memorize the main ideas. A year after I left his office, I was watching a TV town hall where he was asked a question about education and without hesitation, his answer was almost word for word. This is my point. The governor's accomplishments cannot be understood without knowing the character of the man. Public hearings were a part of the commission's deliberations. He fulfilled his commitment and chaired the hearings. Every speaker from the school groups repeatedly made the same three points. They were concerned, there must be local control, and they wanted more money. Several professors made esoteric points, but never like the school group suggested anything practical. He had to start from scratch. Not until later, as I recall, the Michigan Education Association didn't say anything. Instead, they came regularly to talk to me. The MEA ended up supporting his efforts, but no support came from other school groups. The beginnings of reform. In a special message to the legislature, the governor outlined changes in the financing of schools by proposing legislation and constitutional amendments. The most significant legislation shifted the funding of schools largely to the state. He proposed a statewide tax to replace the widely different local property levies. One of the most controversial elements was that lay teachers in non-public schools be supported by state funding. He wanted good education for all students. In addition, the governor supported student achievement testing to monitor the status and progress of schools and what might be done to improve achievement. Charlie Greenleaf focused on student achievement testing and was instrumental in getting the legislation passed and signed by the governor establishing the Michigan Education Assessment Program or MEAP. Coincidentally, later I was responsible for the program and even later Doug was responsible. During that time, funding for vocational education and special education were adopted. In the early 70s, the California Supreme Court ruled the system of finance unconstitutional because of the large disparities in per pupil expenditures across school district. I recommended the governor follow suit. I had several conversations with Lieutenant Governor James Brickley, who was an attorney. Later, the Attorney General, on behalf of the governor, started a lawsuit. Much to our surprise, he won. This intensified the interest in the governor's proposal. However, a year later, the court again opined the decision was not providently given. Apparently, the court could not define equity, so it could not craft a legal remedy. Defining equity remains elusive. But the interest in the proposals remained high. Equity and school finance. High tax-based districts raise large sums at low rates, while low tax-based districts raise small sums at high rates. The state made adjustments by way of the state aid allocations, providing more revenue to low tax-based districts. But over time, the differences became larger based on residential and commercial property values. This became the major focus of education reform. In the first commission meeting, the particulars of the situation were discussed. The governor quickly identified the problem and the possible solutions. One, give more state aid to the poor property value districts. Or two, move schools away from the property taxes to statewide taxes. Both had problems raise state taxes to give to the poor without increasing aid to the rich or reduce the reliance on the property tax and increase another. As the, decision, as the discussion continued, the alternatives became clearer. One, change the state aid formula, and two, adopt a constitutional amendment to limit the rate districts could levy and increase state taxes. The governor decided to be bold and do both. Developing equal yield. I developed a formula to provide state school aid so districts with the same millage would have the same per pupil revenue, combining the state and local contribution, hence equal yield. But there would not be enough money to make it happen. There had to be an upper limit, a cutoff where rich schools could receive no state aid, so-called out of formula districts. 
There was no computer in state government where I could do the calculations, so I went to MSU for help. The governor had to know the total cost of the state and the impact on every district. The director of the De Department of Management and Budget gave me the total cost target and made the judgments of how acceptable the district by district results would be. The answers were no and no, not enough money and unacceptable district impacts. But there was a solution, phase in the formula over several years. That was what the governor was looking for, a fiscally and politically acceptable proposal passing the legislation in the House. The House was controlled by the Democrats and they were reluctant to give the governor a win. There was just one problem. Equal yield benefited many of their districts, especially in Wayne County. I had become friends with school superintendent from Wayne County, Harry Howard, in a poor district with the highest millage in the state. He was the poster child for the proposal. Fortunately, there was a group of 14 districts in the same area who had a lobbyist representing them and a House representative, Bill Keith, who favored the idea. Things got even better. There was a teacher strike in one of the representatives districts and I helped him get settled and we became good friends. With some democratic votes and the Republican votes, the bill passed. Bobby Krim, who led the opposition, was unhappy and inserted a provision giving the 14 districts extra money to one up the governor. After the legislative session was over, the governor's staff went to the governor's house on Mackinac Island owned by the state. He reviewed the results to make plans for the next year. The special provision for the 14 districts came up and I recommended a veto because it would set a bad precedent. I had been with the governor for only a short time and an influential department director opposed the veto and said, governor, a veto would be bad politics. I remember what happened to this day. The governor jumped out of his chair and extended his right arm and in a loud voice said, if that's the only reason it's gone. I had won on good policy and the director had lost on good politics. That said a lot about the governor and how he governed. The legislation was led in the Senate by Gil Bursley and paradoxically Bill Keith in the House. They were most instrumental in the success. The governor's equal yield school funding was phased in and paved the way for the constitutional resolutions. Property tax relief. Property taxes were high and in many school districts and the governor wanted to provide some relief. He asked DMB's director, Jerry Medler, to develop a proposal. It was called a circuit breaker. The idea was to tie property taxes to income, thus making it easier for lower income households to vote for school millage. Doug and I worked together on this. He schooled me on taxation. The result was called the Homestead Property Tax Relief Act. The state would provide a credit equal to 60% of all property taxes paid in excess of 3.5% of household income. This provided immediate tax relief, and in addition, the act provided an additional incentive. If you voted for additional school property tax millage, the net cost to the taxpayer after the credit would be only the 40% of the increase. The act remains on the books today, but as a result of a significant constitutional change in 1994, it's less important to school funding. Property tax relief coupled with the equal yield formula made substantial difference in the distribution of school dollars the governor's constitutional amendment. There was little organizational support for the governor's constitutional amendment. The Republican party was neutral because the impacts were different depending on the district. Democrats were against it, mostly for political reasons, and they wanted a graduated income tax, which was prohibited by the constitution. Surprisingly, the MEA supported the amendment and was helpful in getting the over 350,000 signatures required to get the measure on the ballot. I met with the leaders of the school groups repeatedly trying to get their support. They wanted assurance for more money and, all, and that all schools would benefit, which was impossible. The governor was committed to the amendments and there was a series of town halls around the state where he personally made the pitch. He was well received, but there was a concerted effort by the Democrats to include the graduated income tax. The governor's constitutional amendment did not pass, but it was close. Interestingly, it passed by large margins in college towns and lost in other places. The main proposals of education reform, the equal yield formula and property tax relief were accomplished. The constitutional amendment to limit, property to limit school property taxes and all of the less critical items were not. But the reform ideas continued. Reform finalized under Governor Engler. During these times, Doug had several positions within government and we worked together frequently. Later, Doug was state treasurer under Governor Engler and heavily involved in what transpired. In the spring of 1993, this, after several attempts to change the constitution, the state still faced the problem of high school property taxes and differences in per, per pupil expenditures. 
The Republicans controlled the Senate and proposed a bill calling for a 20% reduction in school property taxes. The Democrats were planning to introduce an amendment which would strike 20% and insert 100%. This would totally eliminate all school property taxes. The Senate would either vote down the amendment showing that they were not serious about cutting property taxes, or the governor would be forced to veto the proposal that would be used against him politically. Governor Engler decided to support it. Two days later, the state of Michigan repealed all school operating property taxes. The rest is history. The constitutional amendment was adopted, reducing property taxes, increasing the sales tax, and distributing equal school dollars for every student. The Millican Educational Reform Legacy. What started with a kernel of an idea, a commitment, and a commission was finally accomplished. However, the Millican legacy is more than just his accomplishments. It is more about the people he touched. There were far more individuals who contributed than those identified. It was his leadership that encouraged and enabled us to be successful. He was our teacher, coach, cheerleader, and our friend. It was an honor and a privilege for all of us to have been associated with him. And I'm going to save uh, some of his uh, broader thoughts after we hear from our other two speakers. Again, those are the words of uh, Jim Phelps, not me, uh, who was unable to uh, speak uh, th this morning um, as he woke up uh, sick, and we're sorry uh, about that. Um, but he may be able to join us uh, in a bit. Um, so now uh, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Bill Rustin to help uh, bring us up to date from, uh, from Prop A forward. All right. Well, uh, thank you. And uh, I want to echo some of Jim Phelps' uh, words there. It was a very uh, deep privilege for me to spend uh, so many years, 12 years actually, with Governor Milliken. I came to him as an intern from Michigan State University and worked my way up into a variety of, uh, of, uh, of, of jobs in, in that office. And uh, he was always a wonderful person to work with. Uh, from him, I learned that you listen, you don't shout. Uh, that, that public service is a, a noble career. And uh, uh, he was a wonderful man and uh, uh, a wonderful man to work for. And he left a legacy uh, in Michigan, not only in the education arena, but in the environmental arena and in the economic development arena in a whole host of areas, civil rights uh, uh, legacy. He left uh, an important legacy to, to all of us in Michigan. And it was again, a privilege to work for him. Um, I want to mention a few things that have happened since 1994. When we talk about the question of, of, of equity, um, you, you got to understand that, you know, as the courts were unable to resolve it, we as a society really haven't been able to resolve a good definition of equity. What do we mean by equity? Uh, how do we compare what is spent in one district versus another? Is it, should it be based on the needs of the, the children in the district? Should it be based on some other things? And we haven't done a good job of, of defining what we mean by equity in a way that has been agreed to by the general populace as a whole. So that continues to be a challenge. Uh, from 1994 on, uh, the focus on, on education really came down to one of trying to maximize the dollars that were available to each individual district, largely, largely by focusing on efficiency or what was perceived as efficiency by members of the legislature. Uh, since that time, of course, we've adopted a new charter school program in Michigan. I want to make clear that we're talking here about public schools, not private schools, that uh, the Constitution continues to prohibit money for uh, non-public education in Michigan. So we've had a, a, a massive movement toward charter schools. Uh, we've moved to what are called schools of choice. In other words, uh, where you can have... Uh, a student from one district attend school in another district, provided that that district opens the opportunity to, to kids from other, other districts. Uh, we've gotten, uh, Jim mentioned in his presentation, the, uh, the establishment of, a, of, of testing programs. Well, the MEEP test and the No Child Left Behind test and a whole series of tests have been incorporated into education since then. There have been major reforms to the relationship between uh, teachers unions and uh, employers, uh, including the big one, which was Michigan becoming a right to work uh, state in 2012, meaning that uh, you don't have to be a member of the union to, to be, a, be a teacher in Michigan anymore. 
there has been uh, tenure reform. Uh, tenure, tenure, tenure laws have been changed. Um, and perhaps most importantly, in terms of moving toward equity in some way, shape or form, there's been a vast, a big, huge new commitment uh, to early childhood education for four-year-olds in Michigan. Getting children ready, helping to get children ready to attend school. Michigan has made major investments into early childhood education in the last several years that uh, is hoped to improve the school system. But the challenges that Governor Milliken talked about as it relates to education remain to a large extent today. I'm gonna read to you uh, a quote from him uh, from 1969, April 4th of 1969. This was a, a televised message, special message on education that he gave on that date, April 4th, 1969. And here's what he said. He said, even while acknowledging that education is paramount, we must acknowledge that it is in deep trouble. It is in deep trouble financially because demand has outstripped present tax resources. It is in trouble qualitatively with too many of our young people not being properly or relevantly educated. And it is in deep trouble in that opportunity to learn hinges too often on such accidental factors as the neighborhood in which children live or the cultural environment in which they spend their first few years. So those challenges that he identified in 1969 remain many of the challenges that we face today. Okay, Matt, all set. You're on mute. All right, thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, and next up is uh, David Arson. Hi, thanks, it's, a, it's an honor and pleasure to be with, with, with you all and, and to hear from folks that have firsthand uh, experience with the uh, Millican administration. I wonder if I could just take a, a, a moment to step back a little bit before I get into the current context, just with the things that you just heard in a little bit uh, broader context, um, just so folks would know that the, the U.S. Constitution doesn't mention uh, education. Historically, that authority has been delegated to each state that has a, a, an education clause in the Constitution, and, and basically, states all delegated that authority on local governments. Okay. So in the richest country in the world <laughs> and the post-war period, we had an extraordinarily decentralized system that local districts were making decisions about how much to tax themselves, about the curriculum, about the assessment, about personnel policy and the rest. Okay. Um, after World War II, with a population dispersion and, 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 and a great uh, suburbanization, and in the rural districts, uh, a, a, a more uh, a consolidation movement. And it was in the 1970s that for the first time, this issue of terrific inequalities in the ability of local communities to pay for taxes through local property taxes became an important and alive issue. And it went, moved its way through the court system, starting with the Toronto case in California. Okay? There became a growing recognition, despite Despite the, 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 the values and, the, and, the, and the, 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 the traction of local control, that in order to have equity and adequate funding, the states would have to play a larger role. Okay? And most of that was done in the way you just heard about the Milliken administration, for guaranteed tax-based uh, state formulas that directed more aid to low property wealth districts. Okay? But as you heard in Michigan, uh, leading up to the 1990s, that wasn't enough. There were two key issues, property tax, which taxes was, which was going up, and the gaps, despite the state program, between the high and low revenue districts was growing. Okay? This provided, along with a lot of other things, the context for Proposal A in 1994, which established the system that we have now. Proposal A had two main goals. One was to lower property taxes, and the other was to lower the gap in the revenue between the high and low districts. And it largely accomplished both of those goals. Um, uh, uh, it, it also created the per pupil foundation system. We got rid of that guaranteed tax based approach uh, as a primary source for, for, for funding Michigan schools. Uh, and that, that suggested the foundation over time by the legislature every year. Um, uh, 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 and, and over time, that adjustment of the foundation narrowed the gap between the high and low revenue districts in Michigan. It didn't eliminate it all, but it narrowed the gap significantly. The funding also followed the student. Okay, 
That was essential for the development of, of Michigan school choice policies that have emerged right about the same time for the charter schools and industry choice. Proposal A sharply curtailed local voters' ability to control the funding of their school. We gave that authority over to Lansing. Okay? So there's a lot of responsibility on Lansing at that point. Proposal A never got around to funding of facilities. Okay? That they didn't have time. <laughs> it, 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 so funding is totally decentralized. It's all based on local property wealth without any state aid. Michigan's funding of facilities is in a pre-Serrano world, leading to terrific inequalities in the ability to fund facilities. The last point, this is the key. Proposal A predated the eras of states setting rising expectations of learning standards for students. Okay. So and importantly, at no point since the passage of Proposal A has there been a deliberate effort on the, on the government's part to adjust the amount of revenues that schools receive in order to meet the outcome expectations that the state was setting. Okay. After 25 years, we can take a look now at how this system is working. And Michigan holds some terrific examples for the rest of the country. They're looking at Michigan for the lessons that we've had here. Okay. We have a state education system. The state now controls the funding, controls the curriculum, controls assessments, to a large extent, it controls personnel policy. All right. That's not necessarily good or bad. It depends what the state does with this authority. Okay. In Michigan, we focused on accountability and choice without the kind of accompanying effort to get a funding policy that's in sync, that makes those two uh, 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 policies work well. Okay? And, 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 and we just haven't, have, haven't been able to do it. Uh, uh, and, and, and so after 25 years, uh, we, can, we can see that, that, that schools are not performing as well as they should. Um, since the passage of No Child Left Behind in 2001, Michigan ranks dead last in proficiency growth on the national assessment of, 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 of academic performance in reading and math. Okay, um, uh, we are also the lowest in revenue growth in both total and per pupil over this same period. If you think about this, so so the, if you think about what has happened with the state control, one on the funny side now. Is that, the per, is that the funding has not kept pace with inflation. One, the basic funding has not kept pace with inflation, declining real value. And secondly, we've done a really poor job of adjusting the funding to variations in cost across local districts. Okay. By definition, these are things that districts don't have control over. They have to do with student characteristics, like special education, like poverty, like English language learners, about density and transportation and the like. We haven't done very much there. Okay, um, but I can come back to this. Uh, special aid funding is a huge issue uh, that, we, that we really do need to pay attention to. The facilities funding is a huge unmet uh, uh, issue. Uh, 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 Matt asked me to address the current context. I have a hunch that I'm running to the end of my time, uh, but, but there is a lot of thinking in recent years across a diverse range of interests. Um, the School Finance Research Collaborative uh, with their adequacy study, uh, a number of different reports. Thank you so much. Um, uh, again, uh, we're just taking questions in the chat box, so feel free to just send a chat to the panelists um, if you could, or to everyone. Um, and if you're not already identified, or we have a question from that says it's from iPhone. So if you're not already identified, um, if you could just say who, who you are, that would be useful. Um, I'm going to while you're typing your questions, I want to make sure that um, I also uh, mention uh, Jim Phelps' uh, broader uh, uh, points, he wanted to make uh, some additional comments on current issues, so I'll just read those real quick. 
Uh, after leaving the governor and moving to the Department of Education, my research effort shifted from school finance to school effectiveness, and the governor frequently asked me how MAPE could be used to improve student outcomes. I regret not having an answer then, but now I do. One, under the current system, all schools have essentially the same dollars per pupil, but not the same student outcomes. Therefore, funding is not the source of the disparities of student outcomes among individual schools. Three, the disparities are because some schools are more effective than others in utilizing their resources and school effectiveness can be accurately measured. Four, because every school is unique, there is an individual remedy for every underperforming school rather than a one size fits all program that has been tried repeatedly in the past with a little success. And five, he says he has a way to identify and prescribe individual school by school remedies. So in short, improvements in student outcomes depend on individual school effectiveness, not on funding. If poor performing schools are given more money to do the same things, they will get the same results. So low performing schools must do different things. And he's offering to help in the future with that. So again, those are the comments from Jim Phelps. I just wanted to make sure that we, we get those in. Uh, so the, the first uh, question to, to uh, David and uh, uh, Bill is about uh, private schools. Uh, there was a, a proposal C in 1970 um, that uh, affected uh, private school uh, funding. And uh, the questioner wanted to know about that. Um, and if you want to comment more generally about kind of how the how private schools were thought of in this uh, discussion and, and, and kind of how the public private dynamics developed. Well, let, let, let me let me start off uh, uh, as as Jim and his and uh, his wonderful piece uh, talked about the governor actually did support and was interested in providing public funding to private education. But in 1970, the uh, so-called parochiate amendment was on the ballot, and uh, the the public voted it down, uh, arguing. I think the public was arguing at the time that uh, um, uh, there there needed to be a clear separation between uh, religion and the state, and because uh, this would have provided uh, education funds to. Uh, uh, to parochial schools in addition to other, other kinds of private schools. Now, there is a provision in there that provides for transportation between those schools. In other words, I, I actually grew up in a community, Frankenmuth, uh, up in the, the, near the Thumb of Michigan, where, where there were as many kids in the local Lutheran school as there were in the, the public school that I attended. And, uh, but the, the, the transportation system was done commonly, which was provided for in that constitutional amendment. I'm not sure that, uh, in, in terms of the question here, that uh, proposal C decimated the private school community. It, it, it just re it re it actually reinforced what was, was already the case, did not permit the, uh, the, the, the public funding of private, private education. And, uh, that stands to this day, and we have some very healthy private schools out there. Uh, continue to have those. David, did you want to add anything? You're on mute, David. Yeah, you're muted. Well, I, I appreciate that, that, that historical account. Uh, that's right. Um, uh, there have been a variety of legislative and legal efforts that have broadened scope for the extension of public funds to private schools. Um, and so now uh, through shared time arrangements, uh, many, many private schools are having their instructors, uh, courses are being paid for uh, with public funds. Uh, they've contracted with public safety to offer them uh, services. Uh, and a number of school districts have gone on the market advertise their ability to offer these classes to private schools all over the state, uh, we have this phenomenon. So, so there is public money moving to private schools well beyond the transportation. Uh, and, and, and so this is a tricky area that, that, that gets attention now and then. Uh, it, it, it's not well uh, 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 monitored. <laughs> uh, the legislature has had some questions about it and, and even Governor Snyder had questions about is this growing fast. Uh, and so it's an area that deserves uh, a little more careful attention. I also say, uh, in, in terms of privatization, I mean, Michigan's charter school system uh, 
uh, is one in which uh, the private sector plays a much more prominent role than in other states. Uh, Michigan designed its charter system in a way that, that, that embraced private management companies, most of them for profit. And for, you know, for a variety of reasons I could go into it, but that's a different model than other states have adopted. Um, and, and so in that context, the kind of regulation and, and, and rules that accompany the charter uh, design uh, matter a lot. And so uh, they're, they're in, in addition to the, the, the early issues that surfaced back in the Millican era about the extension of, of, of public funds to private schools, this is not a set, uh, uh, it's a moving target. And clearly the evolution over time has been towards the an extension of a much broader range of education services being provided outside of local uh, school districts. Uh, we also have a, a couple of questions about uh, special education uh, funding and how that was related historically and now uh, to this issue of educational equity. Um, and there's uh, Representative Laurie Stone says that uh, the research collaborative has uh, established that student populations or some populations require additional educational resources to make academic gro growth. So how does educational funding reflect that understanding? She says it doesn't yet. Um, Matt, I, I just, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. The so first question, yeah. Go ahead. The first question was just directly about um, how does special education funding work into educational equity? And then the second was about this, this broader issue that some student populations require additional educational resources. Sure. So special ed is an easy case to understand, right? In, in the sense that we all understand that there's special education, a, a student with severe disabilities, hearing, vision impaired, multiple uh, 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 cognitive disabilities, these students are gonna require additional uh, 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 services. It costs more to educate. The federal government sets the requirement for special ed in the, uh, in the establishment of the Individual, individual Disability Education Act. They, had, they were initially expecting to kick in 40% of the money for that, but they never got past 10%, okay? So they, in order to get that 10% of the funding for these costs, <laughs> they reduce, I'm sorry, uh, uh, the states have to come up with their own system. And Michigan has a system, unlike most, uh, where we reimburse a percentage of the local district costs, uh, 28%. That was established, that 28.6% that was established through grant litigation. Okay. So what that means is that um, the state is paying about 28%, a little bit more for transportation. They leave the rest at the local level. But proposal A, for these required costs, the local districts can't say no, they're required to provide the services. They have rights, that special ed kids have rights that the regular education students. So we sent 70% of that down to the, to the local districts. That is to say, 10% of the feds, 30% of the state, um, uh, uh, we're down about 60%, I'm sorry, uh, at, at the local level. If the ISDs can come up with some funding for that, the ISD level, special admittedly, that helps a lot, okay? But the ISDs have very unequal capacity, just like local districts to pay. And the state also puts a cap, an arbitrary cap on the number of mills they could in the levy based on what they were in 1994, okay? That means that most districts have to take money out of the general fund for regular education students to pay for required special education classes for students. On average, this is about $500 per pupil per year for the state of, 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 for all kids. In some districts, they're putting in about $1,200 or more out of general revenue funds for basic education and special education. There's no other state that is as stingy in funding special ed as Michigan. And it's not just an issue for, for special ed kids, but for all children because of this encroachment on the general education budget. We know how to fix this. The, the School Finance Research Collaborative actually with a weighted pupil formula for based on, you know, special ed kids cost more, how much more. We can, if, if you have a, a modern system, you weight the foundation for those special education kids, 
based on the severity of the disability. Many states do this. We have steadfastly refused to move in this direction. We have high quality research from the best outfits in the country telling us you got to try this. Uh, but so far, we haven't made a lot of progress, but the momentum is clearly building as people understand how this is working. I, I think David's, uh, David's point is a, is a great one. You know, I, one of the things that I learned from, uh, uh, from you know, my time in, in public, uh, public office or public, uh, public affairs working for in various ways is you got to strike when the iron is hot and you got to build what, what uh, Daniel Yankelovich called a public will. And as, we, as more and more people begin to understand what the challenges are here, um, uh, we'll get to the point. We will get to the point. We're not there. The legislature, what you got to understand is the people that run for office generally uh, are, are people who want to run to the front of the parade. They want a parade that they can run in front of. So you've got to create a public will to be able to, to, to get things big like that changed. And I think we're moving in that direction, but we're not there yet. The legislature has been unwilling to consider uh, 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 changing the law to, to make it more equitable for districts across the state. So uh, Bob Maxfield asked uh, you, uh, David, if how school funding under Prop A has grown, particularly in the last decade. Um, you mentioned that it hasn't kept up with inflation. So um, give us a sense, it was passed. So kind of give us a sense of the, the timeline here. When, when has it fallen short and when is it keeping up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, there's, there's a, you'll get slightly different answers if you, if you have a different beginning and end point, depending on how you adjust for inflation in the past. Um, we, we clearly took a hit with the, uh, with the Great Recession. Was hurt. We lost ten. We lost jobs for ten years straight. It was a harder recession than other uh, than, than other states. But we've also had a, had a, had quite a, a rebound. And and and, and the assess is what, what share of our personal income in Michigan are we devoting to education? Okay, that's a that's a you know a, a, an indicator of, of tax effort. And that thing has continued to go right down. Okay, we are well. <laughs> I don't know, I, 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 there were like $12 billion below the Headley cap. You know, back in 1978, we said the state revenues can't go, uh, go above a certain percentage of, of state personal income. Well, hello, even after the state takes over all that responsibility for school funding with schools away, they digested that. We are now at a point where we are in the neighborhood, last I looked, about $13 billion a year below the cap. Okay, that means that that's as big as the whole amount of the school aid fund that we're devoting at this point. Right? So the, the, the issue is that the terrific decline in tax effort for K-12 funding and other things in Michigan, other things funded by the state government. If you look, uh, and that's, uh, that's, that's what people don't understand. So when you uh, insert your comments, um, uh, sometimes we don't get them. Also, William Price just wanted to mention we didn't we didn't get your your full comment. If you if you wanted to add one, um, so how have the we, we talked about how in in Bill Phelps' uh, talk that the um, Jim Phelps has talked that the uh, party coalitions weren't weren't quite consistent that we had MEA and Milliken on one side. Um, how, how has this developed since then um, in terms of the, it, it has, you know, when, when did the kind of lines, uh, clear lines between the parties and, and ideological sides uh, develop here and, and have there been any kind of continuation of the, of the strange bedfellow coalitions? That, uh, that that the answer to that question is 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 is, is, uh, is steeped in a whole lot of political science uh, <laughs> uh, research that's gone on over the last uh, several decades, beginning beginning basically when the Republicans kind of adopted the Southern strategy, going all the way back to Lyndon Johnson and Republicans that were there. That that is when things began to shift politically. If I uh, uh, you know, I mean, and I think it's from my own personal perspective, it's it's a uh, 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 it's sad. I mean, it's it's tough to reach a chord between the two parties on any issue today. We have become so polarized that it is tough to deal with very 
difficult, particularly with very difficult issues, you know, beyond education, which is a tough issue. Uh, you know, we, we got roads that are that are deteriorating and bridges that are deteriorating, I mean, the environment that is that is deteriorating, and we can't get the two parties to come up with uh, solutions that they can agree on. If you go back to the '70s, that was a, was an era in which people were willing to sit down and talk with each other yeah. to work through problems, yeah. to listen to commissions and special uh, efforts that were were created. We don't do that anymore, and we've got to get back to that. The only way we make progress is in uh, you know, America has always made progress in the middle. It's always made progress in the middle. When you, people come together, when the public says, we agree, the Republicans say, we agree, and the Democrats say, they agree. That's when you move things. So we've got to figure out ways in which that can happen again. That's a broad philosophical statement, but I, I, I truly believe it. We made way more progress on a whole variety of issues back in the 1970s than we're making on any any issue, name the issue today. So, Bill, thank you for saying that. <laughs> thank you very much for saying that. Um, I, I, I agree 100% with what you just heard, and he can say it with a lot more authority and credibility than I can. <laughs> but if you don't mind, let me just uh, add a footnote to that in, 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 on today's topic. Um, because when that, when that vote was taken, and the and the legislature in England did that, did that, that bold move of eliminating the property tax as a way of funding Michigan schools with nothing to replace it. What was that? What, that was like in the, in the end of the summer or something. Beginning of, and they had to come up with a new system to fund the schools by the end of December. All right. Think about that. And so what do you do? This is an area before term limits. So you had you had the, the, the Republican caucus nominate six people. There's the Democrats, six people. And there as 150 years of experience on appropriations and education committee among those 12 people. And they're meeting to figure it out. And somebody gets mad and they stomp out of their room. And they come on back in here. Come on, sit down. Right? And they worked it out. And you know what? It was pretty good. Well, and that guy, it was pretty good. They accomplished with that policy what they set out to do. It didn't solve everything. And that's the problem. We haven't been able to get back to that kind of bipartisan negotiation. And so I would have an, uh, some idea about why that, how that happened. Of course, it's a national problem. But, there, um, but I'll, I'll stop there. I'd like to come back and add some points to this. Um, Matt asked the question, uh, uh, well, 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 how has the Republican position evolved over time with the advent of choice. Okay. Um, and, and I have many perspectives on this, and, and I'll just say that it's um, back in the pre proposal A day, Republicans tended to be more local control. Right? Local, let this be a, a, you know, a local decision, and it would be the Democrats and the EPA and others say, hey, hey, hey. We, we need more state authority here in order to, to get more equality. Right? Um, and, and maybe, you know, a, a range of other things. And so the deal back then was, all right, we're going to lower the property taxes. And we're going to get greater equality. But at the same time, we got uh, uh, this, this new system, this new exciting. And when Proposal A passed, for the people in my field, the exciting part was the choice part. And we had a funding system that matched up perfectly with that new choice system. So we fixed the choice, we, we got the funding how we wanted, the money's gonna move with the kid, but we never fine tuned that funding system to match up effectively with either accountability or school choice. It caused inequality and inefficiency. And I'll just say my sense, I'm not a political scientist, there are other people that know more about this than I do, but just as an observer, okay, my sense that, that what's different in the last 10 years, as opposed to back in 1994, in addition to term limits, is that, that once the power was concentrated in Lansing, there were struggles over how to define this education system. Right? And they used that power, to, to, right? but, um, but I'll say a, the Republicans, moved more in the direction 
of trying to expand the provision of the services outside the traditional system, locally governed system of school boards, of school districts. That's where the unions were, that's where local school boards were. And it sort of was an impediment to the privatization uh, efforts. Okay? And that divide became much more central in the last 10, 15 years than back in the militant days. Um, and it creates new divisions, both within the Democrats and the Republicans. So, so there'll be areas that are high, you know, high um, affluent suburban areas, um, not, not, you know, for, for um, that have different takes on this than other uh, areas, say rural areas uh, in, in, in northern Michigan, where community schools are the center of the community, and you lose a few families and you've lost 40% of your revenue, okay? And what's gonna hold that community together, right? So Bill, just one quick follow up. The, the, we heard that at the beginning, it, it, Detroit was seen as a potential beneficiary. Um, to what extent have we ever gotten beyond uh, seeing this as a Detroit focused issue or a racialized issue? Uh, in this uh, uh, debate about uh, school equity? Well, and let, me, let me approach the, the answer to the question from a little bit broader perspective. I mean, we, we still have enormous equity problems. I mean, it, we, we haven't, as, as David pointed out earlier, when the courts couldn't define equity, we still as a society haven't defined what we mean by equity. It hasn't happened, we, we haven't agreed on that. So you, you gotta understand that from the beginning. But as it relates to Detroit, you know, I can remember back in the 70s when Governor Milliken was uh, uh, was making friends with and working with Coleman Young, who was the mayor of the city of Detroit, when he was roundly criticized by members of both parties for uh, uh, for talking with, uh, with with the mayor of the city of Detroit and trying to work through things, uh, and uh, he was 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 often criticized. For that and for his interest in Detroit. There were those at the time that were saying, look, we just ought to let Detroit float off into Lake Erie. I think over time, over the last 50 years, we've made some progress. We now understand as a people in the state of Michigan that you can't have a great state without a great city. You can't do it. And I think we, having, having gone through some of the, the Detroit equity package was a big piece of it. The creation by Governor Milliken of the the state revenue sharing formula that provided additional funds to Detroit was a big piece of moving us in that direction. Frankly, the bankruptcy that the city of Detroit went through several years ago, uh, it was a piece of it. We're now to the point where we can begin to see the, uh, a future for that city. And I think the public generally understands today that we, again, we can't have a great state without a great city. So I think we've made some progress in terms of that public will that I talked about. You don't hear people saying, just let it float off into the into, into Lake Erie anymore. People are going to Detroit. They're going to the Tiger Games. They're going to, to see events when we don't have a pandemic. They're going to the restaurants down there. It's changed. The attitude toward Detroit has changed, but we still haven't grappled with the central equity problem. What do we mean by equity? What about the, the, the kid who needs more services than, than other people? How do we deal with, with that? How do we uh, make education truly equal across the state. We had a question about uh, the teacher retirement plan funding with Prop A and, and that effect. Um, do either of you want to address that? David, you know the retirement system well? Yeah. So, um, one of the issues that happened with school delay is that I mean, we have a statewide retirement system for school employees in the states. Uh, it's, a, it's a good system to be in place on a public stuff, but uh, running as a defined uh, benefit program, um, the funding uh, on the basis of preschool retirement. So when proposal A passed, the funding obligation for this was to get the funding out of the state uh, to the local districts. Um, the, the district built into the original foundation would have had some growth, growth in the funding obligation to the local districts over time. But when 
So districts would hear from the state two things every year they need to make their budget. One, what is our per pupil going to be? And what's the, what's the, what's the contribution rate for Mexico? And that kept going up. Okay. Uh, 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 and, and then, of course, their enrollment. And they can make a budget. You might find out that in my book of the school year that started. Uh, but, but, but I'll say that the obligation for this has increased over time, of course. Uh, there's questions about changes that should have been maintained at state solvency. Over time, the decision was made to reduce the state's obligation to shift the risk onto employees as opposed to um, uh, the employer. The national idea moving from uh, from defined benefit to defined contributions, and that's what we're doing in this year. And so we have a, 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 a retirement a, a system that's a little bit less attractive. Maybe a lot less attractive for young people who are looking for the special day that was in the, in the generation for the all right well that's gonna to have to be it for the the first panel um because i want to make sure that we have a full hour for the next uh panel so i believe uh, brian's going to lead us uh, for the next panel but i believe we're going to take a uh, two to three minute break uh, just to um, get everyone situated so you have a chance to to get a drink before our next panel start back up at three o'clock folks David, you have another commitment at three o'clock, correct? Uh, yeah. Um, but is it, is, do you want to talk about anything? No, I'm, I was just saying that, it, you know, I, I know that you had another commitment. Yeah. If, if okay. If you want to, I'll, I'll to sign off. That, that'd Good be luck, appropriate. Tara. I wish I could hear. <laughs> are you listening, Tara? You are right <laughs> next to me on the computer screen, Tara. Hey. <laughs> Friend, are am I? Oh, hi. Yeah, 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 yeah. That sounds great. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you so much for your comments today. I wish the sound wasn't messed up. If somebody would have. Yeah, I think it might be you know your your your, your northern location possibly well, might be impacted. But I got a come I got a mic I got an external mic to plug in and uh, they said they didn't need it. Uh, it was a sound test, so a sound but I should have plugged it in. It was kind of going in and out for some reason. I don't know. Ah darn. Yeah, we picked darn. up some gems though. Yeah, all good. We caught the meat of it. There's no question about that. Yeah. I'll give it one more minute. I don't know. Some folks might have stepped away. Okay, welcome back to the Governor Milliken Education Legacy Forum. Uh, thank you to Matt Grossman for leading uh, a rich discussion on school finance. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to Jim Phelps uh, for his comments that he uh, wrote and shared that framed many of Governor Milliken's efforts towards education. Thank you to Bill Rustum, uh, who offered his remarks that shaped Michigan's education landscape since Proposal A, including thoughts on assessment, early child education, and teacher tenure. Thanks to David Arson, who highlighted the decline in education funding over time, 
and lifted the school finance research collaborative recommendations. I think we all have found value in the opportunity to reflect on the legacy of Governor Milliken's school finance policies and the chance to consider the impact of those policies given contemporary context. We now turn to the impact of Governor Milliken's legacy on education infrastructure and learning. No discussion about education policy, specifically infrastructure and learning today, can be had without at least considering the current COVID-19 pandemic and the reality and challenges faced by educators, students, parents, and policymakers. Likewise, no discussion about the legacy of one governor can be had without at least considering the complexities that every administration faces in the context in which they make decisions. Governor Milliken was not immune to frustration on the part of some of his constituents, but his legacy of policy and decisions are overshadowed by his style and his approach, a legacy of building bridges and consensus. The remaining time we have together will highlight his efforts to improve education opportunities for students in Michigan. Consider for a moment that, this, that his time as governor of Michigan started in the wake of the civil rights movement and ended around the time of a nation at risk report. Governor Milliken clearly presided over a tumultuous period in our state and our nation. Making decisions and creating policy about and for education, especially with an eye towards equity, come with serious political risk and with stakes raising throughout each election cycle. Our next panel will articulate such perspectives, including the Milliken era perspective shared by Doug Smith, the current context with Tara Vanzant Chambers and bridging the gap with C. Robert Maxfield. I will offer each of our panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves and provide our virtual guests an overview of their perspective on education and equity, specifically around infrastructure and learning. We will then move towards questions to further dialogue. First up is Doug Smith, who was education and civil rights advisor in the administration of Governor William Mill Milliken retired executive director of government and community relations, Oakland Community College, Doug Smith. Thank you, Brian. Um, it's a privilege to, to be with everybody today. And I just, I have to underscore Jim Phelps's and Bill Rustam's comments about Milliken. Rather than repeat them, I would just have everyone listen to them again. Um, he was an extraordinary leader in terms of inspiring staff. Um, it was a privilege to work for him. I would mention two things in that era, though, that add to just add a note to what Bill and, and the others have said. You know, number one, he had two staffs. He had a policy staff that I was on that was directed by Pat Babcock, a liberal Democrat, and then George Weeks headed the policy, headed the polit political staff. I don't think any governor has separated his input as as directly as as that ever again. But it was very clear when I came in and gave him, I, I actually replaced Jim Phelps on the governor's staff when Jim went over to the Department of Education. And um, I would say that, that um, you know, oftentimes I would give him an analysis of an educational bill and taxation. And he would say, Doug, you know, and I offered the political implication of it. And he'd say, Doug, let George and I do that. I just need to know how it affects and who it affects in the state of Michigan. And I mean, he was absolutely um, uh, certain about that, that he wanted to know what the policies were and how many people it affected. And he didn't want to mix policy and, 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 and politics. Um, and I think that, that that's a legacy that has never been repeated again. The other element that was there, and I think Bill Rustam can attest to this, is after we'd go and fight with Jerry Miller and go, with Jerry and go in and fight in appropriations for bills. Um, afterwards, we'd go out and have a beer or have a pop with the other staff and the other legislators and everybody got along. I've never seen that again, where you know, you'd fight it out, but you had respect for each other. You recognized you came from different perspectives. And I think that what I'd call after hours issue, um, again, was never replayed with any administration since then. So I come to the issue with a bit of a different perspective because um, I've worked in a K-12 system, uh, community college, public and private, four-year colleges, and I've worked in, in government at the local, county, and state level. I've worked on both sides of the state in Grand Rapids and Oakland County and of course in Lansing. 
Um, I'm going to refer a little bit to some of the issues on school finance because I think they undergird some of the discussion we're about to have. Um, I began my career as an intern and then administrative assistant to Senator Gil Bursley. So the Bursley Act was the first major educational reform, um, at least in our lifetime. Um, as such, I helped draft particularly the categorical grants of the Bursley Act, sat on the State Board of Education. The governor had a seat that um, his education advisor would sit on for five years, helped write a desegregation plan for Benton Harbor schools, and spent one year in Austin, Texas, drafting a new school finance reform for the state of Texas uh, under the National Conference of State Legislatures. Um, this panel and this opportunity gave me a chance to go back and look at some of the articles that I'd written for the governor or with the governor um, and uh, speeches that I gave at that time. And I would simply note you know, that many of the issues we face school reform today, and Bill Rustum said this, um, are very similar to the ones that we battled with in the early 70s. Um, and I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in just a moment. But first, let me set the stage. In terms of the era, it was really Serrano in California and the Millican versus Green case that you know, challenged the constitutionality of the school, state, school finance system, um, not just in California and here, but, but nationwide. And so we had that lever to try to change things going on. Um, the two big differences though, as I was listening to the earlier comp, the two big differences that we had were, number one, um, Bill and, uh, and Jim Phelps both talked about, we had to level up the school districts. We couldn't put much of a cap on the top districts, although there was some later. Um, we had to level uh, the spending up. And in order to do that, we had a large surplus in 71, 72. Um, that helped us get off on the right foot um, with a pretty significant funding um, approach that was required if we were going to level up the low spending districts to the higher, higher spending districts. The other is back in the 70s, the state played a much more significant role in the funding of transportation, uh, school construction, and teacher benefits. And so I think those are the things that differ a little bit when we when the Bursley Act was passed. Um, and I, I just, in, in, in respect, the Bursley Act, I think, had a reasonably good formula. Um, you heard Jim Phelps describe uh, the yield that it did, that it was trying to make sure that equal effort and equal district um, gave equal dollars. Um, the first two or three years of the Bursley Act, um, there was tremendous funding in the general fund formula. Uh, two things happened, that by year five, you really were not seeing the gap close. It closed dramatically in the first three years. Um, less so in year four and five and by five. The two things that occurred were one was the state funding um, did not keep pace with what we needed in order to keep the, the, the poor districts um, moving, the, closing the gap. The second was a, was a more hidden issue. And that was that by year five, 40% of the state funding was in categorical grants and special ed, vocational ed, that actually worked against the formula. Um, the, it was never intended that 40% of the, of the total state funding would be categorical grants, um, whether it be special ed uh, or vocational education, um, but that's, that's what happened. I think that's what, what drove the, um, the Bursley Act gap and why it was not successful over the long, over the long run. Um, and again, we're faced with that same issue today of funding. Uh, I apologize, but I want to read two quotes of things that I wrote for the governor. Um, the, um, these are from 1977, so 43 years ago. One was a, a view from the Capitol article um, for the Principal Magazine. And I'll read it real clearly because it, it does show, now I'm talking about how we face the same issues today that we were facing back then. The critics of American education ought to take a moment to examine the dramatic changes in society in the past 10 years. Even a cursory examination identifies numerous inventions, improvements in technology, and increase in complexity in the relationships among individuals, organizations, and institutions. Schools have served num numerous purposes in the past, from social change agents to community forums, to the socialization process for young people, to the traditional setting for teaching the basic skills. Even if schools are willing to continue to fulfill these functions, many changes will be, will be necessary. That's as 
you know, as, as useful today as I think it was 43 years ago. The, the second quote was one that I, I had drafted for the governor. Um, he was to speak at the National PTA Conference on Television Violence. And um, I believe we've made great progress, but I still think we have an awful long way to go in terms of this disparity and the gap between rich and poor. And this is how he, I gave it in his absence and it was kind of interesting for me. I was 22 years old and I sat next to Jesse Jackson. Uh, so it was, a, it was quite a moment. But, I, but the quote was from Postman and Weingartner in what was the school book. And here's what he said. More than any other social institution, the American school mirrors what we want to think we are as a people. But when we approach it to ask, are we not the fairest of one of all? It keeps replying in most irritating fashion that we are not. And over the past 20 years or so, it replies have become nasty accusations, in some ways nastier than ever before. Our schools have been telling us that we are becoming dehumanized, empire building technocrats, and that we care more for our missiles than our children. We are being told by the facts of our schools that we are racist, that we aim for mediocrity, that we cherish conformity, that we have no love of learning, and that we have lost our moral fervor. Well, that paints a pretty ugly picture, and I don't think, and I think we've made great progress. That was, you know, that was something that was the governor's words 43 years ago, and we have a long way to go to try to achieve, you know, those ends. Um, finally, I just make a couple comments on the challenge going forward. And, and that is um, facilities have to be safe havens. Online learning will play a much more important role in education than ever before. So iPads or um, home computers and access to internet becomes part of the issue of facilities. The pandemic is in no way, um, it, it may have a silver lining. And I believe that has moved schools ahead maybe 10 years. And, I, and I'll explain it using an example of Oakland Community College. Um, when the pandemic hit, we had less than 10% of our classes online. Within two weeks, we had 90% of our classes online. Some of the faculty that said they would never teach online um, became the champions of teaching remotely. Um, Long-term, I believe it's a hybrid. I, I perhaps, you know, the, the, the advantage, the silver lining is that we'll go to six day school, six days of school, um, and the th oh, but the students will only attend three and they'll have smaller class sizes and they'll use more of their learning online. Um, the technology gives us the really opportunity. We've talked often about individualizing um, education in our schools. We now have computers that allow us to do that. Um, we need to meet that challenge. Thanks, Doug. Really appreciate your comments. Uh, next is Dr. Tara Vanzant Chambers. Tara is professor and associate dean for diversity, equity, and inclusion, MSU Department of Education and Administration, and the College of Education. Thanks, Brian. I have a few slides to share today, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes, okay. I am going to take take a little bit of a different perspective um, or take on this conversation than um, the other folks on the on the panel. Um, and you know, I'm a new Michigander in terms of folks sitting on this panel. So I'm well aware, oops, sorry, um, of the position that I take here. Um, I have a little bit of a background in um, politics having served um, in the US House of Representatives and then um, spent some time with the U.S. Department of Education, but the Michigan context is still, um, you know, I, I understand that there's a different kind of landscape going on here. Um, I do also serve on my local school board, which gives me an, another perspective to share, um, but for about the last 20 years, my research basically boils down to understanding contemporary implications of desegregation policy. So with the 10 minutes that I have, I'm going to just sort of give an overview of some of the context as I approach this, I, my charge is to talk about the contemporary landscape. So I thought that I would um, spend a little bit of time talking about the ways that my research intersects with this question and then use that as kind of a foundation for the, for the conversation that we'll have coming next. Um, and I chose the title for this. It all just kind of falls together, a retrospective on educational equity in Michigan. Um, 
because as I was thinking about this conversation, I was thinking about a quote from one of the participants in a qualitative project that I did almost um, 15, almost 20 years ago now uh, with um, black students. And, oh, why is this not wanting to advance? Okay, yeah, that quote. Um, black students, high school students in um, tracked math and English classes. So students who were in um, high achieving classes, regular classes, and then a credit recovery program, um, an alternative education program. Um, and one important set of findings from that project related to stratification that began, uh, we're talking elementary school, I guess, and how that stratification was exacerbated as the students got older. So by high school, it would have been incredibly difficult for those black students to break out of the tracks that they were in my contribution also there was around the institutional factors or school factors that contributed to that separation um, and stratification. And so this quote from Nicole, it all just kind of falls together, is her talk, the larger quote, she's saying, um, actually, I have the quote here, let me, that's what the paper was that flashed before. Um, I think more white students have a, tend to have a confidence, like, you know, at home, you're going to take advanced classes, and their friends take advanced classes. And so it all just kind of falls together that, you know, this group of 15 people ends up in the same class. They've gone to, grown up with them. They've, um, they go to church with them or they go to synagogue and they live next to them and they ride the bus or they play soccer with them. And so you're taking advanced classes. Sure, I'll take advanced classes too. It doesn't seem as daunting. And then so I asked her if she, it would have been difficult for her to take these advanced classes if she hadn't been, this is a black student, taking courses with white students if it would have been difficult um, if she hadn't had that same kind of familiarity with the white students. And she said, I think it would be terrifying. I had never been outside the circle of the white kids in advanced classes. So it was never a question of whether my friends were going to be there. But if I wouldn't have had friends, if all my friends would have been in basic, you know, regular classes, I would have been in regular classes too. Um, and so I want to come back to these institutional factors and the ways that the school contributed to these experiences just a second. But I want to talk about another key finding or contribution of that work, which was that tying this contemporary issue of school tracking within a broader historical narrative around desegregation was an important contribution. After the Brown decision, there was an increased use of tracking. Um, and so I think it's important to think about these ways of stratification of tracking of a form of within school segregation, just as we talk about between school segregation. Um, and so hold on to that conversation or that thought as we move forward. Um, so these institutional factors that I just mentioned a minute ago, um, I was interested in the way that schools contribute to these tracking decisions and the implications for students, but Nicole's quote and the experiences shared by the other students um, suggested that there was a larger story that needed to be told around the advanced, uh, the students in the advanced class not knowing other black students in the school or a lack of connection um, with black students, these kinds of things. So that led to another project that I worked on um, where I was able to explore um, this additional layer that went beyond tracking that was about stratification and the implications of their academic success. So this is the work that I'm doing now on racial opportunity costs. So the idea that these, these high achieving students were successful but at a cost was reminiscent to me um, of the idea of an economics of opportunity cost. But with racial opportunity cost, I'm looking at the price of academic success for high achieving students of color. And like my previous um, project on tracking, another important contribution of that is understanding the ways that schools exacerbate or alleviate these costs. This is another qualitative project with individual interviews and focus group interviews with students at two um, elite colleges reflecting back on their high school experiences. Um, and so an important contribution of that project was fleshing out the nuances of this racial equity cost idea um, as the concept is in the theory and, and we found that this idea of racial opportunity cost was relevant to the experiences of most of the students in the project, suburban, urban, private, charter, big, small, pretty much any school type that the students were coming from, this idea of racial opportunity cost kind of held, but the black students who were attending predominantly white suburban schools seemed to be the prototype for this experience of racial opportunity cost. And so this screenshot of the articles, one of, one of the articles is kind of a foundational article for this work, but there are other articles I'm working on a book and some other things. So, all of this sets the stage for me moving to Michigan. Um, 
as this project and racial opportunity cost was taking off, um, my family and I moved from Texas to Michigan. And this was exciting to me because of my background in desegregation. Um, the 1974 Millikan v. Bradley decision is kind of a key feature in the desegregation historiography. And so I was excited to learn more about um, the landscape of desegregation in Michigan after the 1970s and kind of what unfolded here after what last I knew about um, what desegregation via the Millikan decision. Um, and so that's when I learned about the proposal A, um, which my colleague David Arson talked about a few minutes ago, that passed about 20 years after um, the Millikan decision. Um, and I won't go into that. David did a good job of talking about that. I do also though want to talk a little bit about the research team that um, on this project, the other research that I'm talking about are pretty much projects that um, that were mine, but this one involves a broader team. And so I just want to give a shout out to Alonzo Gilzine, who is one of the research assistants. Also Chris Thalen, who is another one of the research assistants. And then Dr. John Yun, my colleague who led um, a lot of the quantitative analysis. Um, so this is a title side, didn't translate well in bringing over into these slides, but um, so we focused on the unintended desegregational impact of um, Proposal A. Um, again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about um, the, I've got a child here in the background who wants to come um, pop his head in, but I'm telling him not to come over here. Um, but the research questions that we took on in this project were really about how did the racial composition of districts involved in the Millikan decision change over time from about 1970-ish to 2013? Um, to what degree did inter-district choice um, or Prop A play a role in the changes that occurred over that period? Um, what factors explain districts participation in, in um, inter-district choice? And then what future research needed to be done in terms of rationale for why um, school leaders participated or didn't participate. Um, and I don't have time, I'm looking at my clock, to go into a lot of the, um, the actual findings here of any of these projects. I just kind of trying to show a research arc here, but I do wanna show these cool heat map slides that we produced showing that this is Detroit in 1970. And what you're seeing is the dark blue represents isolated white 90% to 100% white districts. And then as you move to the darker red color, you can see there's no dark red on this map in 1970, that's isolated minority, meaning um, nine, zero to 10% white. In 1970, we have you know, predominantly white suburban areas outside of Detroit and Detroit even itself is, um, it's predominantly minority, but doesn't go you know, it's completely more order yet. But as we move to 1987, we see things start to shift. Um, in 1995, now we're looking at, starting to look at the impact of um, Proposal A, we're starting to see a shift in the, in the suburban districts becoming a little bit less isolated white and Detroit becoming more isolated black. But a real shift beginning to happen in 2005 and then into 2013. And the irony of this desegregation happening, having been challenged and stopped in the Millikan decision in 1974, but proposal A ushering in this opportunity to desegregate, although that was not the primary objective of that policy. So um, just as I kind of wrap up here with my 10 minutes, um, you know, we have continued this work to look at beyond Detroit. This is a pattern that happens in several metro areas across the state where, the state where there are these suburban metro um, areas. Um, we are also looking at particular implications of these patterns for districts facing financial crises like Benton Harbor. Um, and as then as I make the connection across the tracking research that I talked about, the racial opportunity cost work and this desegregation work, I'm really looking at how you know this unintended um, desegregation that's happening in suburban schools, even if unintentionally, is potentially creating challenges for students of color. Um, around the racial opportunity cost work that I've that I've talked that I've uh, mentioned today, and that unintended nature of the desegregation really being a feature of something that we need to um, focus on. Uh, and so I'll just kind of end by saying, you know, I think the thing that le links all of these projects is it does look like from afar that all of these things just fall together. But the findings across um, these projects that I've talked about really suggest a more complicated narrative. So I'm going to stop there.
in terms of providing a foundation from the, the perspective that I'm offering on the panel. And I look forward to hearing your questions and comments and I'll stop and share. Thanks, Tara. Really appreciate uh, you sharing your comments and your slides. Uh, our next panelist is Bob Maxfield. Bob is a retired superintendent in Berkeley and Farmington School Districts. He's associate professor and interim dean of the School of Education and Human Services at Oakland University. And he will be bridging the gap. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Doug, thank you for your opening comments on uh, the, the impact of the Millican legacy on uh, educational excellence and the some frustrating, some positive. Tara, I really appreciate your work on, uh, on equity. I was superintendent in one of those districts that went through one of those post-proposal A transitions. And indeed, it raised some interesting challenges. And sometime I'd love to talk to you about the work that has been done, and I think it's still being done by the Minority Student Achievement Network nationwide. But what I wanted to focus on today is the, uh, and I, part of my, my section was called Bridging the Gap. And there was a wonderful dream that William Milliken uh, proposed uh, in terms of school funding and school excellence, uh, and certainly meeting the needs of all kids. And in many ways, that dream has become a nightmare. Uh, the promise of state control has really has served badly most, most students and certainly served badly most uh, educators. But I want to specifically focus on teachers uh, because what we're hearing now, and it's at the heart of everything that Milliken would have hoped to have achieved, is teachers saying, my profession isn't what it used to be. The biggest horror for me is teachers, including my own two sons, who say, I would not want my child to be a teacher. Uh, my grad students at Oakland would say, I don't want my child to be a teacher. My, my colleagues in the Farmington School District would say the same thing. That is a horrible thing. I mean. That's a horrible, horrible thing to have happen. So why? Well, many teacher salaries have been frozen. Uh, and in real dollars, they're making less money because they're paying more for their retirement and their health insurance. Uh, their support has waned in terms of advantages for the reasons Doug, uh, Dave Arson described, uh, financial support. But I also believe that their human support has waned. Uh, I don't know if we've gotten past that stage where we simply didn't trust teachers. Uh, to me, one of the great obscenities is the, came from a vendor who said, I have a new curriculum that is teacher proof. Teacher proof, how can you possibly say such a thing? And yet school districts sold year after year on teacher proof curriculum. So uh, indeed the, uh, the outlook for teachers has not been good, but I'm gonna present a more positive view. And the positive view is based on a, a history that I've been involved in, a project I've been involved with since 1997, and that's the Galileo Teacher Leadership Project. Uh, this started with six school districts and, and or actually seven school districts, including a couple of community colleges in Southeast Michigan. Uh, it now contains or can, includes 32 institutions. And since 1997, uh, almost 1300 teachers have become Galileo teacher leaders. And they're different teacher leaders. They're people who believe that you can lead from where you stand. They're people who can believe you can support your colleagues. In many cases, they are people who have become wonderful principals and central office administrators who recognize that systems have to be built around the strengths and the interests of their teachers. And that's the only way to equitably serve kids. So Galileo has provided a, a, a wonderful uh, vision of what could be. In fact, it was started with a, a large grant from the Kellogg Foundation. And in, in pitching that proposal to the WK Kellogg people, uh, one of their grants people said, you know, we've tried everything else on school reform. Why don't we try the teachers? Well, 20 plus years later, we're still not totally sure that that's the right thing to do. But I believe that what, we're, what, we've, been done, what we've done with Galileo, and later we created the Oakland University, the Galileo Institute for the Study of Teacher Leadership, which has gone way beyond the 33 districts, has promoted research in that area, and has, uh, has certainly supported teacher leader initiatives. Most recently, in the last three or four years, a group of folks came together under an umbrella called uh, Trusted Voices. And this was a spinoff from Galileo, where we basically said that teacher leaders can be powerful in their classroom. They can be powerful with their colleagues, 
But what if they were able to reach out beyond their school and their school district and have an impact on policymakers, uh, citizen leaders, certainly legislators. And so out of this evolved something called Trusted Voices. And uh, there are four trust or Galileo, we call them Galileo Fellows at Oakland University who are leading this effort statewide. And they have created a network of now 30 Trusted Voices folks uh, as far away as the UP. And it's an effort to bring teacher voice to the, to the, uh, to the table, bring teacher voice into a bipartisan conversation about what's really necessary for school reform. They uh, began by putting their focus on the school finance research study that was mentioned earlier, uh, but they, uh, uh, they've continued to work hard to build that network, Trusted Voices. Uh, Trusted Voices has reached out to uh, the unions. It's reached out to uh, the State of School Board Association, the Superintendents Association, and Trusted Voices has been a key player in developing something called the Education Caucus. The Education Caucus is made up of legislators. There are something like 35 or 40 members of the legislature who are former teachers who were waiting for a chance to come together and talk about some of these issues. Uh, Representative Cheryl Kennedy from Southeast Michigan and Representative Brad Paquette from the west side of the state have been two of the legislative leaders of that effort. So as we move ahead, as we talk about bridging the gap, I think it is really important to say, let's start listening to our teachers. Let's start listening to their thoughts on what real equity means. How do you meet the needs of all of the kids, not just those high, achieve, high achieving high flyers. But somebody mentioned earlier, and you did Brian, that we've had this pandemic and, we've, and our teachers have been dealing with something since March they never thought they'd have to deal with. Uh, and what has happened as a result? Well, I, Here's my message, the message I've given to our Galileo folks, and I want to repeat it now. And I don't remember who got the credit for the original or for the statement, a crisis is a horrible thing to waste. But it was, I think it was one of the Clinton, a uh, member of the Clinton administration. Yeah, we have a choice. And we could either get through this pandemic and get back to school and do just about the same old stuff all over again and uh, pretend it never happened, or we can learn from the experience. So what can we do? Well, one, we need to listen to our teachers, as I said earlier. Uh, what many of the superintendents that I deal with now have said is they are delighted with the role that teachers have played during this crisis time. They're delighted with their ability to come together with teams to figure out how to meet the needs of children. And they're doing it without a lot of external direction. They're in it, they've been thrown in together. As one of our, one of our trusted voices guys said, uh, it's like we're all first year teachers again and we're having to learn how to do it right. Well, let's take advantage of that. Secondly, we need to support new models for collaboration. And that's gonna require changing our systems. So, much, so many of our systems have been historically top down and it kind of almost contradicts an effort by teachers to come together, collaborate, to work, uh, to work as in groups to solve the kind of problems needed. Uh, thirdly, what the co what this, Coronavirus, coronavirus uh, uh, episode has taught us that the gaps between rich and poor, between black and white, and between able and disabled are greater than we ever knew or were willing to acknowledge. Because as you try to provide instruction for children at home, even in the most affluent homes, it's hard. Can you imagine, and we all can, how hard it is in Flint and Pontiac and Detroit, Ben Harbor, and other places where families are struggling to keep it together and now they have to figure out how to educate their kids at home. So equity is, it's been driven home dramatically. And when we come out of this, hopefully we can step up to it in a better way. Fourth, this provides an opportunity to rethink self-directed learning. Uh, Doug mentioned some of that and, I, I, and it doesn't mean turning kids loose, but it does mean that certainly at the high school level, does a child really have to be in school for six or seven hours a day? Can they be out in the community doing internships? Can they be out working in, in social service projects? Can they, they be interning at a law office? Goodness knows what all they could be doing, but they certainly have that opportunity. And finally, technology isn't the be all and end all, but some of our teachers are discovering new and creative and exciting ways to uh, to use technology in a way that engages all kids. So my point is that as we 
try to bridge the gap between the Millikan dream and the reality of today, uh, we have a resource at our disposal and our teachers that we need to figure out how to engage much more effectively. And as we do that, we need to reflect back on this pandemic and decide what have we learned and what can we do different going forward. And I think if William Milliken was with us today, he'd say, you're right. That's what I was hoping for in the late 60s. That's what we need to do now. So thank you for that time, for the time to share this and uh, be happy to respond to any questions there might be. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, uh, Doug, and thanks, Tara, for your opening comments really appreciate uh, you sharing your perspective. Uh, there are already a couple of, of questions um, in the chat, uh, one directed uh, to Tara. Could you please give some examples of how K-12 schools exacerbate the racial opportunity cost and uh, using whether, whether current or past findings? Yeah, that's a great question and I'll try to do it somewhat quickly so we can, uh, since it's just directed to me. And I'm happy to sh you know send any of these articles or other resources to anyone if you just want to email me at tara at msu.edu, just my first name. Um, but there are really kind of four aspects of these institutional factors or school factors that I talk about. They are, we can exacerbate or alleviate through climate, through engagement, through structure and through relationships. Um, climate is about the kind of, the, the climate around achievement that we create. I think about a student who said um, that he was given a message in his school that you know he really should aspire to be a doctor or a lawyer. If he were to pursue being a plumber like his dad, that really wasn't living up to the potential that he had. So are we, the question I always say is, are we creating subjective values around what academic achievement should look like? And are, we, are those norms um, inclusive? The um, engagement factor issue is around helping students feel like they belong or alternatively pushing students out. Um, lots of really great examples of the ways that we create opportunities or um, don't support opportunities for students to feel like they are um, engaged in the school environment. Um, relationship factors are just what they, what you would suggest they would be. We have lots of opportunities and interactions with school personnel every day. Um, you know, from a student who talked about being um, a student laughing, a teacher laughing at her when she said that she was going to go to Harvard, that was her dream. Just those kinds of microaggressions every day and the relationships that go along with that. And then the fourth factor is um, structural factors. And that really relates to the um, opportunities for stratification that exists, the tracking research that I talked on the front end. So those are, that's my quick take on the institutional factors, but I'm happy to talk offline too. Thanks for the question, Chandria. Thanks, Chandria. Appreciate that question. Uh, next is the question from Tyler. Uh, desegregation seems like it can take mostly white. It can take mostly white schools and find ways to incorporate students of color, or it can take mostly minority schools and find ways to incorporate white students. Are either of these models preferable to the other? Does either approach address the social pressures that students of color face, like the example you gave as a result of stratification? I mean, let me let me add something or respond to that first. Um, in, in the conversations with Milliken when I was his education advisor, he often talked about you know what desegregation should try to accomplish, and um, he really never believed that it, it was about the integration of white and and black students. And again, his relationship with Coleman Young and with Detroit was pretty significant. It was how do we create you know a school system that provides um, equity for everybody. So um, his, his long-term dream was how do you build up an African-American community like Pontiac? And whether it be the school system or it be the community, you know, you're not trying to make it something that it isn't. And if it's an African-American community, then how do you provide the resources to, to do just that? Um, and at the end, the, the end of the day, it wasn't to try to, by quota, provide some number of whites or some, you know, in a black, uh, uh, school or the number of blacks in a, in a white school, even though that was what kind of the, 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 the definition of the day was for, for desegregation. Um, I'm going to talk to just a little bit about some of Bob Maxfield's comments um, about the teacher, et cetera. I mean, one of the things that Millick and I often talked about is it would really be nice if we could um, have uh, schools fund administrative posts um, and have the top five to 10 teacher posts pay the same amount of money. 
so nobody would ever leave the classroom to go to administration. Not that you couldn't. I mean, some teachers, as the Galileo Project shows, I think become the very best administrators. But at the same time, you shouldn't have to leave teaching if, if that's your forte and if that's what you're really good at, um, you know, to, to earn to earn the kind of uh, to earn more money. And so that was something we never quite figured out how we could put that into any proposal. But um, I, I think that's that's part of it. The other part is if you read the research, um, you know, some of the research clearly says that it's it is principles that are this, uh, the one thing that make a difference in, school, in K-12 school systems. But when you look at those principles that make a difference, it's because they support their, their teachers. Um, you know, they've, they elevate their teachers to a level that they need to. Um, and then the other issue is societal. I mean, we, don't, we do not today um, have the kind of trust, as Bob said, of teachers or hold them in high esteem. And uh, that's unfortunate. I mean, all of those things are going to contribute to ultimately improve quality education. Let me jump in on that too. The uh, kind of add something to what Doug said, and then I'm going to go back to Tara. The uh, Rochester, New York, for 20 years has figured out a way, and it has it's been rarely replicated to provide a teacher salary schedule that's the equivalent to the principal schedule, and you grant you move to it through a career ladder. Uh, Adam Rabansky's work in that area is fabulous and uh, uh, it's really worth uh, paying some attention to. Back to Tara. I mean, I'm not sure, or back to Tyler's question rather. Uh, I'm not sure whether integration into a primarily black school or a primarily white school is, I don't know what the difference is, but because I, I had an experience in a district that changed pretty significantly while during my tenure from being predominantly white to being one of those mixed ones that showed up in Tara's chart. Uh, and the beauty of it was that these were families who had chosen to move into the community because they wanted something better for their kids. Uh, and they, but they recognized they were also giving up something. They were giving up the, uh, the friendships that their child had in the previous district. They were giving up uh, that sense of security. Uh, I remember a parent coming into one of our high schools and uh, our child coming into the high school and she was being counseled to go into a regular English class and the answer and the mom said but she was in honors English at Cass Tech and the teacher the counselor said it's different here well I was glad that story got to me because everybody got tired of hearing it but the point is of course that child should have a right to be successful but those kind of pressures subtle and not so fresh subtle went on it was also a factor in our our community that a significant, not the majority, but a significant number of African-American kids after their high school experience chose to go to historically black colleges. And their answer, their argument was, I can be comfortable again. Um, and that to me was, was telling as well. Well, I would just, you know, I think I, I agree with my colleagues have said, I, you know, the, um, that is how, in your question, Tyler, the way you've presented it is, is pretty much how desegregation unfolded, mostly with black students moving to white schools. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm a closet historian, so I'm gonna try not to, um, you know, go into lecture mode too much. But way back in 1935, W.E.B. Du Bois um, wrote an essay called, Does the Negro Need Se Separate Schools? 1935. And his argument in that, ar in that um, essay is not really making an argument for desegregation or, or against, but to say um, really about what is what, what power are we handing over to white schools um, in this transfer? How, how do we trust in a system that doesn't care about our kids? You know, a lot of questions like that. And I think that we, at the time, I'm not sure how it was received, but as I look back on that essay and think about the questions that he raises there, I think there's a lot of really good um, good thinking. Um, I, I agree that the way that desegregation unfolded was perhaps not how um, the original framers thought that it might. It became about moving kids around on buses um, and into white schools. It became about the dismantlement of really special um, all black schools and institutions that were portrayed in a particularly negative light, but when you hear the firsthand accounts of what happened in those really special schools, there is um, a lot of nuance and value there. 
We don't talk about the wholesale firing of black teachers and administrators that happened as a result of the Brown decision. Um, and so whenever I hear conversations now about you know black teacher shortage, I'm always really quick to say, we had whole generations of black teachers who we fired um, and, and we lost through the process of desegregation. I'm certainly not anti-desegregation, but um, I have a lot of, uh, a lot to say about the way it unfolded and the ways that, um, Black families, Black communities have not just in education, but sort of perpetually been um, disempowered, um, disenfranchised, and um, that really being the root of a lot of the problems that we're seeing in schools today, is lack of support of Black communities. Thank you. Uh, I would also agree with An Anissa's point here about the Nice White Parent podcast. Um, it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I was just about to highlight that. Thank you, Anissa, for, for sharing that link. Um, you can find that link in the chat box. Uh, next question comes from Angie. A crisis is a horrible thing to waste. I, I love that. Try to remind our teachers daily to only stress and be anxious over the things that they can control. What is being done to gather and collect the voices of our current educators and how can we gather the information to truly learn from them? Let me let me jump in on that. I mean, certainly for the 30 plus school districts that have been involved in Galileo, uh, to a greater or lesser extent, they've all looked at the system that they have and they've asked, are we really paying attention to the needs of our teachers? Are we taking advantage of the voice? Uh, the work that we're doing that the folks at Oakland and Dr. Suzanne Klein is now heading up that project. Uh, is designed to promote that whole notion of teacher engagement in a broader area. We've had some dissertations done on that topic. We've had certainly some of our classes reflect that. So uh, there's a lot of work to be done there. But I also would call people's attention. And I, if you get in touch with me, I'll give you the contact uh, to the people who are leading this trusted voices effort, because I think that in a, has a powerful, powerful potential to unleash teacher voices all across the state uh, in a way. So, uh, so by all means, contact me if you'd like to know more about Trusted Voices. Great, thank you. Other thoughts on how to collect uh, teacher voices? Um, I would just say that, you know, I would echo the, the point that it's really important. I think early in this pandemic, there was sort of a recognition of, wow, teachers' jobs are really hard. And, um, you know, in my opinion, we're kind of seeing a backslide on that of, you know, in, in all of the ways that this pandemic is really challenging. Um, teachers, again, are being asked to do a whole lot. Um, and I have the, you know, privilege of, um, you know, hearing my son's fourth grade teacher, as I, you know, support his online learning. And these teachers are giving it everything. I mean, I, <laughs> he's got hand puppets, and he's got all kinds of things going on. And, um, and I'm, and I, absolutely know that the only difference now is that I'm seeing it in a different way. These are things that teachers were doing before and just, you know, you don't see what's happening behind the, the doors of a classroom as a parent most of the time, um, but also recognizing how much more challenging it is um, on top of what is already a challenging job, what we're asking them to do, managing online learning and hybrid learning and moving back and forth and, you know, the, not to mention the health um, concerns that they each face. I, I'm very concerned about um, our teachers in this process and certainly our students and families as well. Um, but I guess I just am not necessarily adding anything to your comment, Angie, but just to say, um, I, I agree that really understanding what's happening from the teacher's perspective is maybe not something we have truly um, gathered yet. Sarah, you alluded to something also that I'm afraid has happened. And that is that last spring, teachers got all kinds of acclaim. Uh, they were seen as everyday heroes. Uh, what's happening in school board meeting after school board meeting is that people are stepping to the microphone as they worry about their kids being home and whatever. And all of a sudden teachers become the fall guy, fall guys and gals uh, in terms of, well, if they just would get it together and go back to school, we'd all be better. Uh, so I'm afraid the tone, you know, people's appreciation has waned a little bit and uh, we need to get past that. I would just, and I'd underscore what Tara said as well as what Bob said. I mean, just using a community college experience, I mean, we went from 10% to 90% online because we simply turned over and said to the faculty, here's what has to happen. 
and you make the best you can. And it, it was unbelievable what they did. Um, the collaboration among faculty. Um, they had the decision making in their hands. And unfortunately, I see that backsliding. All of a sudden now, you know, it's back to the old system where the administration makes the decision for the teachers rather than the teachers collaborating with the administration to make those decisions. I think it was a moment in time. I hope we don't lose. I see another question uh, from Yvette. How do we recruit, retain African-American males in our classrooms? Oftentimes when African-American males are successfully effective, they are moved out of the classroom into administration. I can speak to that myself. Uh, would love to see the foundation support African-American male teachers and in initiate initiatives to sustain them in our classroom. I uh, would love to see African-American men also in kindergarten teachers or even early childhood. I'm gonna jump right in here and just say, yes, absolutely. We need to you know, increase the pipeline and, and um, it's an important thing. My son um, has had two black teachers. He's only in fourth grade, but he had a kindergarten teacher and a second grade teacher. Both of them were women. Um, but just that experience has been so transformative for him. Um, and now both of those teachers have left the district. So, um, you know, it's something that's on my mind a lot. Whenever I have this conversation though about um, increasing the pipeline or encouraging more people to enter the profession, I always have won the conversation about, well, we had a pipeline and we let it go. I'm always making that point back to the historical foundation of what was lost with desegregation. Yes. Um, but the other point that I always wanna make is about um, are we ready for the teachers when they come? A lot of, I have a little diversity cartoon that has, I don't know what it says, something about your, you know, your job is to hire people who don't, who look different from us, but think just the same. And that is absolutely what we kind of expect our black teachers to do, our teachers of color. We want you to come, we want you to represent diversity, but we're not necessarily ready for anything different from what we have expected um, of our, of any of our teachers. And that's not okay, right? There are, this is another experience extension of the work on racial opportunity I've talked about in terms of these um, white normed expectations around academic achievement. It's absolutely the same for teachers and administrators who are expected to perform, to, be to be behave, to speak, to dress in ways that conform with white normed expectations. Um, and that's something that we need to really take on and, and challenge ourselves. So yes, we need to increase the pipeline, but we also need to really think about are we creating environments, cultures, climates that are conducive to black teachers wanting to be here? Yes, yes, and yes. That's, that's really, that's a great <laughs> comment there. The, uh, uh, one of the uh, latest uh, positive accomplishments by the Trusted Voices Network is that they've now expanded to include, it's either two or four Detroit teachers uh, and represented in that is a group called BMEA, which is Black Male Educators Association of Detroit. Uh, and these are our young men who are really working to encourage more young men to pursue it. But uh, we discovered that in my in Farmington when I was superintendent there that if, as we recruited more people of color, if we didn't change how we behaved, if we didn't change how their colleagues behaved, uh, too often the, the black teacher on the middle school team was the one who was asked to intervene with the black child who was misbehaving. That isn't what we should be doing. That's not the point. Uh, uh, but uh, and, and it took a long time to get past that. So, yes, you're right. And Brian, Angie's and Angie's familiar with BMEA. Great, Brian. If I can take a, a crack at uh, somebody's question here about what was the biggest event, da David Winter, um, in Michigan, in addition to proposal. Actually, we look at the state budget. It's it, it's um, it's our you know. Um, prisons and the, the, uh, that whole industry that has taken up a huge part of the budget that in the last decade um, that has you know, limited some of the resources that might be available for education. We incarcerate more people, I think, per capita than any other state but uh, California. Thanks, Doug. Uh, in relation to uh, David's question, I did put a link to um, uh, some resources on uh, MDE's website related to uh, education policy and some milestone pieces there. Thanks to Tanner Delpier for uh, the resource on um, education finance. Um, I also included a link to uh, the Black Male Educator Alliance of Michigan. Um, are there final comments from, from any of you that we would like to share some closing thoughts maybe? 
I guess I'm, I'm just struck at, and, and it was early in the uh, in our time together. Uh, and I think it was Bill when he read that wonderful piece from Bill Milliken about what education in Michigan could and should be. And here we are all these years later and we're still wrestling with the same issues. And will we ever learn? I hope we will. I, yeah, I, would, I mean, uh, oh, go ahead. I, I would just add, you know, I thank you for having me be part of this. It's been very helpful and informative. Um, and it, it is, it's, uh, it does challenge us to what we have in front of us, but we also have made great strides in certain areas. Um, we have a different base to work from, um, but we have to change, you know, the state and the state priorities if we're going to change education because the funding has not been there over the last 10 to 15 years. I think my final Here comment would be that. just a, oh, thanks, Dave. Thanks, Brian. Um, to kind of pick up on, on the same theme and David's question about um, what other, like what other features of um, beyond resources have been important and take a little bit of a different take and say, you know, from my perspective, um, as a school board member in East Lansing and my good friend Brian Beverly is on the school board in Lansing, one of the things that is um, evident to me is just the, the, the competition that we go through um, in this kind of um, fight for necessary resources pit us against each other when really our greatest asset would be if we could work together. Um, it, I see it through my research, but I also see it um, be even more glaringly in my role on the school board is just how how significant those resource disparities can be positively for relatively affluent districts like East Lansing and how devastating they can be uh, for districts that don't benefit from those same kinds of resource um, disparities and are um, not disparities but riches and um, I yeah just just the, the need for us to work cooperatively but instead even not neutrally we're, we're often in competition um, but I really appreciate the opportunity to be on the panel and talk with everyone and look forward to additional opportunities like this. Thank you all uh, for your time. Thank you all for your comments today. Uh, thank you to all of our guests for your questions. I'm going to kick it over to Matt here quickly for closing, uh, but I do really uh, appreciate um, everyone today. <laughs> uh, one note uh, moving forward is on uh, Wednesday, November 21st. Uh, the Institute for Public Policy and Social Research at MSU will be hosting another forum uh, focusing on school closing and reopening uh, during the pandemic. Included among panelists is Catherine Strunk, um, who will be discussing some uh, research uh, related to uh, that, that particular topic. Be on the lookout uh, for invitation and uh, Zoom link. Matt, please take us on. Great, that's what I was going to plug. So uh, it's October 21st, so I'll get in my, it's oh, coming up soon. So yes, uh, so yes, please, uh, please join us uh, for, for that and um, uh, be in touch as we uh, continue to explore public policy in Michigan. Thanks to all those uh, who, who participated. Remember, this will be online and we'll also um, have uh, some uh, extra submitted written materials. I think we're getting a, a blog post up uh, soon on some of the Milliken legacy. So uh, please look for that. And uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>